Amen. Amen. We here. Good morning. Um, hello, my name is Wes. I'm a pastor here at Living Water, uh, specifically over youth. Uh, let's go. We got some youth in the house. Love you all. Um, and um, I am excited to preach this morning. Uh, I am preaching uh, because our pastors are on vacation, and the church said, "Amen." Amen. I'm so thankful for um, our pastors. Are you thankful for your pastors? Um, Doesn't sound like it. Let's give, can we, let's, yeah, there we go. Um, I am super thankful um, that they are not here. And you might be like, what the heck? Are you you sure you're supposed to be here? Um, No, I think that it is really awesome. I'm thankful for pastors who um, know the need for rest. And I'm thankful for a staff team that says, go rest. And I'm thankful for a, a council that lets them do that, helps them do that. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I want a healthy pastor, amen? Uh, and a healthy pa- being a pastor is hard. Uh, it's really awesome, it's really good, but it's also hard and I wanna have a healthy pastor. And so I'm thankful that they are on vacation, resting, well-deserved. And um, I'm thankful for the investment that they've poured into this community. I was talking about it at the 9 a.m. service. Yes, they've been lead pastors here for you know, somewhere around 10 years. Um, but I remember, you know, actually, I don't remember. I wasn't born. Um, pastor John came here in, I think it was 1995. I was born the next year, okay? So hold your horses. Um, he came here in 1995 as an intern and um, he's invested into that community, uh, you know, pretty much since then. And I'm just thankful for that. Um, I'm thankful for who they are. They are not just your pastors, they're my pastors. Um, and so I'm so thankful for them. And uh, I'm excited to preach this morning and a little spoiler, alert, maybe this will make you not want to come back depending on how I do today. Um, but I'm preaching next week as well um, because they're on vacation. So uh, you got me back to back weeks. Um, you're welcome. I don't know. You're Masari. I don't know really what to say. I'm just kidding. Um, but we are going to dive into the series that we've been in all summer. So open your Bibles to Psalm 147. I'm going to zoom through some other passages of scripture. We're going to make a pit stop in Psalm 147, and then we are going to land for the remaining hour and 45 minutes in Ephesians chapter five. Uh, that was a joke. I'm kidding. Uh, if you know me though, you know, I could do it. So don't put me to the test. Um, so Psalm 147, we'll be there in just a minute. But to give you just a little bit of a preface, we are going through some Hebrew words for praise. Everybody say praise. praise. Come on, say like you mean it. Say praise. 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 Uh, we are looking at this word because Hebrew is different than English. Thumbs up. I just taught you something. Hebrew is different than English and uh, so much so that, you know, one word in Hebrew can mean, uh, you know, just, I mean, think about even, you know, like Barak or Yudah, you know, all of these things to, to, to kneel down, to bless God in adoration, to psalm, to laud, to sing, and we get praise right? Or like the word we're going to look at today, like it has connections to pruning and music and, you know, just kind of the flow of poetry, praise, right? Like that's all we get. That's the English language. And so it's important that we look at some of uh, a little bit more to what these Hebrew words mean and some of it behind it so that we can better and more adequately understand when we see the word praise or worship or different things that these words are translated as. So uh, if you've been with us over the summer, you know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Maybe you were here when Pastor Fawn talked about Barak to kneel down or to bless God in adoration, or maybe when Pastor Bob came all the way all the way from Yelm um, to preach to us about Yadah, to lift our hands. Um, and I'm saying definitions that maybe are slightly different because um, there's a bunch of, you know, bunch of definitions to that one word, but, um, you know, or a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving or whatever it may have been to shout, to, to, to halal, the pastor chase all the way from Lacey. Um, last week talked about halal and that, that really actually is the kind of the, um, the most dominant word for praise. It's where we get our word hallelujah. Everybody said hallelujah. Or as my um, two-year-old, almost three-year-old likes to say, hallelujah. Um, 
which is awesome. Um, and next week, we're going to look at a derivative of halal, a different word. Um, but today, we are going to look at a new word. But before I get there, I know you're on the edge of your seat. Uh, I want to uh, kind of just kind of bear my heart for a minute about something I've been thinking about uh, during this sermon series. And I opened this series back in July and kind of talked about, you know, I think when it comes to theological ideas or even just, um, uh, well, just kind of all of our world, you think about Democrat, Republican, or, um, you know, um, different um, kind of pendulum swings, right? We can, we can kind of swing, do you know what I'm saying? We, that's kind of like the, the nature of our world. We swing from pendulum swings. You know, we could be like, you know, some of us tendency is like, I'm a sinner, I'm dirty, rotten. And then others, you know, the emphasis is like, the love of God is so big. When really, those are both true. I am a sinner, right? My best is scripture, you know, different places calls it rags, but I'm also loved by God, right? Like there is truth in some of that. I like to say truth is held in tension, but um, we have these like pendulum swings. And I think that is true for praise and worship. And when we come into this setting, let me, let me kind of explain what I'm saying. Because when we talk about worship, there is the definition more so of my whole life is worship, right? Colossians says, whatever you do, do unto the glory of God, right? Romans 12, which is a big, um, a big um, theme verse for this series. Romans 12, verse one and two says, let your whole life be a living sacrifice, right? And so there's this whole life of worship, but then there's coming here and singing songs and lifting our hands and making music to the Lord, right? Those are both what we would call worship or praise. And I think this is, this is my, my challenge, maybe to both sides, is that the reality that, that worship is more than a song, would you agree? Yeah. Right, worship is more than a song. Uh, it's more than singing. Um, it's our whole life. I think we would all agree with that. I think scripture backs that up. Though that does not eliminate the need for musical worship and singing to God. So, so let me go maybe a little bit more practical. Just because in worship at the end of the day is about your heart, doesn't mean we should just come in here and have a good heart, but don't sing. Cause then we'd all be sitting in silence and that would be a little awkward, right? Right, so it, just because it's about your heart and includes your heart, doesn't give excuse for it to only be your heart. I talked about this in the first week, but it's heart and form, right? I want to have the right heart, but I also want to, I want to out of that heart, want to actually act. I want to give praise. I want to sing to God. And, and I think we should sing to God. But the other extreme is you love coming and singing and praising and kneeling and lifting your hands. You love that. And that's good. Pray, uh, God, I love, I, I love that we love that. But if that doesn't go to, if that doesn't translate, if that doesn't leave this room to a life that's more, uh, a life, uh, sorry, uh, that worship that's more than a song that becomes a life of worship, then we're missing something. Does that make sense? So if we come in here, it's like, well, it's not actually about the singing and lifting our hands, it's about our heart. I think something's a little off there. If we come to this room and it's all about the singing and then we leave here and our life isn't worship, then I think something's off here. And so I want to challenge us and kind of exhort us as we dive into this, wherever you may lean, wherever you kind of swing, what side you swing to, that you would be challenged and encouraged that there is truth to both of those, that I think we should come and we should sing and we should, we should praise with expression. But if that does not become more than a song, if, if my life doesn't become worship, then there's something missing. There's something missing. So that's my, that's my little, I open my heart. Now I'm going to close it. I'm just kidding. Um, not going to close it. Um, let's dive into this. We're going to look at a Hebrew word for praise. Everybody say zamar. 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 The definition of zamar is to sing, to praise, to play an instrument. 
If you don't know much about Hebrew, Hebrew kind of has a family of words. Uh, and this one is ZMR or in Hebrew, Zain, Mem, and Resh. So there's this family of words, um, different from Zvar, like Zimrat or different things like that is used over 113 times in scripture. Uh, this specific one, Zamar, is used 45 times specifically in the book of Psalms. And this word can be translated to English, sing, melody, praise, make music, and play, like playing an instrument. Though I will point out the majority of these translations are singing, and even the ones that aren't directly singing imply singing accompanied with what it is talking about. And so that's what we're going to look at, and kind of the sense of this word and the definition I'll use for today is to sing praises, to sing praises. Uh, I want to dive into the scripture, starting with the first use of this word. But before we do that, I would love to pray. Does that sound good? Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to come together as the church to sing, to sing praises, to worship you, to open your word. God, I thank you for... um, this time that we have together. God, Holy Spirit, would you uh, illuminate the scriptures to us, help us understand? Would you uh, encourage us? Would you convict us? Um, God, would we um, be people that are engaged in this moment, leaving here, um, not just being hearers of the word, but being doers of the word? In Jesus' name, amen? amen? Amen. Okay, Judges chapter five, verse three is the first place that we see this word, zamar. And it'll be on the screen to read as well. It says this, hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. To the Lord, I will sing. I will make melody. Everybody say melody. Melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh, this, in this passage, it is, I will make melody. That is where we see this word, zamar. Um, and w- you know, what is this passage talking about? This is a victory song. In the book of Judges, this is, between, this is two people, Deborah and Barak, and this is a victory song. And this is actually one of the oldest pieces of poetry in the Old Testament. And what this would have, this song of victory, this victory song would have been used for, would, would, would have been in public worship to sing about the victory that God had won. But also, I think this is really cool, and part of why we're here today and why we sing is that these victory songs of things that have happened in the past are used as reminders to future generations generations of the faithfulness of God. Amen. That's why we sing. We sing about, you were like, man, we just always sing about the cross. You know, we just sing, you know, that's yes, exactly the point. We are, we are singing uh, about the cross because that is the victory that we have in Jesus. And we sing about it to remind us because we're pretty far removed, right? You think about 10 years after Jesus died and rose again versus now we're pretty far removed. We sing to remind us of the faithfulness of God. So singing has purpose. And that was what was used for this song, this song of victory. Now I want to read uh, about uh, one, two, three, four, five, five verses, um, kind of giving you different um, um, uses of this word zamar and different ways that it's translated to kind of give you a better picture. So let's look at those. They'll be on the screen behind me. First Chronicles 16, verse nine says, sing to him, zamar to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Psalm seven, verse 17, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. I love that due to his righteousness. he's, he's, He's owed it. And I will zamar, I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. I love that one. I will sing praise. No matter what comes at me, no matter what I face, right? This kind of prophetic stance, I will sing praise. Psalm 27 verse six says this, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and zamar to the Lord. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Psalm 101, verse one, I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord, I will zamar, I will make music. Psalm 144, verse nine, I will sing a new song to you, O God, upon a 10 stringed harp, I will zamar to you, I will play. What are some observations 
that we can take from these passages of scripture that give us kind of, kind of the overview of this word zamar. The first one I think is that singing and music has had a profound and significant role in the life of humanity since the beginning of time. And more specifically, I think it's had a significant role in the life of the church to remember the victories that God had won, to, to celebrate. And I think that carries on today, that it has a significant role to be played. Uh, you know, I th- this, well, this probably doesn't matter, but um, you know, so much so to avoid certain things, they literally banned singing in, in certain time periods in church to focus on certain things. But I don't think that's the goal. I think, no, it's something that should have a significant role based on what we see in scripture within the life of the church. And I think it does in this church, amen? Aren't you thankful for that? I am. Um, and so I think it still has that same role since it's had since the beginning, the significant, profound role to be played. Um, I also, uh, you know, from these passages of scripture, seeing praises is a response. It's a response to God's goodness. It's a response to God's faithfulness. It's a response to God's providence, how he provides for his people. It's a response to the victories he wins. Another observation, I think this one's, uh, heavily uh, missed in the modern church is that singing, uh, that, that this applies then, but it also applies now, that singing was an offering to God, a sacrifice to him. That applies today. Now, back then there was only a specific group, a, a tribe that could be priests, but, but, but in the new church, in the new covenant, God is making us a, a holy nation and a royal priesthood. When you come to church, you're a priest. And your job is to bring an offering and a sacrifice to the Lord. And, and, and the people of God since the beginning have seen singing and making music as an offering and a sacrifice that's pleasing to the Lord. You are a priest and you have a job to come and offer and to give um, a sacrifice and an offering to the Lord. And I wanna answer this question, you know, why, why sing though? Why can't I just talk, you know, why can't I just think it in my head? And that's where we're going to pick up Psalm. I hope you're there. Psalm 147. We're going to read verse one says this. Praise the Lord! Exclamation point. Anybody put just exclamation points in their texts? No, just me. I, I, I swear to you, when I'm texting you, I am not yelling. Just love a good exclamation point. You know what I'm saying? Just does my heart good. Um, praise the Lord, exclamation point. For it is good to sing praises to our God. Let that sink in for just a minute. It is good to sing praises to our God. For it is good to sing praises to our God. It's good. What I love about, I'm gonna kind of have an aside here for just a second. What I love about what I'm doing right now is that if we truly believe that this is the word of God and to be taken as the word of God, then it should be what we come under and submit our lives to and let define what is good. And I say that because there's a lot of things out there and in our lives and even our own, we try, to, we try to get on the throne that only God deserves to be on. And we try to define what's good and tell ourselves what's good. And what I love about coming to the scripture is that even when we don't feel it, or maybe even disagree, that I submit my life and my heart and what I feel to the word of God. <laughs> so what the word of God is telling me right here, right now, is that it is good to sing praises. It is good to sing praises to our God. We sang it this morning. If you said it, I believe it. So if scripture says it, we should believe it. It is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. And you might read that and think, well, to be honest, Pastor Wes, I I think uh, it's more pleasant when I stop singing. I'm not much of a singer. (laughs) And uh, I want to help you understand this passage because that's not actually what it's saying. It's saying for it is pleasant also could be translated for he is beautiful. 
for he is beautiful and a song of praise is fitting. What is he trying to say here? It is not the singing based on ability and talent that is pleasant. It is praise. So praise is beautiful. God is beautiful. So a song of praise is fitting. A song of praise is fitting. So whether you feel like you have a voice or not, praise is beautiful. Praise is beautiful and we are praising a beautiful God. A song of praise is fitting. That is what he is trying to say. And praise God, praise God for musicians and worship leaders who help us give something that is beautiful that help us not just watch them, but help us join together to give to God something that is fitting, a beautiful praise, a beautiful praise for a beautiful God, something that is fitting for him. Aren't you thankful for musicians and worship leaders that help us do that? Because let me be clear, this is not about their talent or ability or them having their own individual worship sesh. They are up here to help us bring something to God. That is the point of what we do here. You know what I, you know what I just, uh, irks me a little bit? Is when we're like at the end of a song, we kind of like, there's like one person clapping and then everyone's like, do I, do I clap? And then like, and then it's just like this half clap. I think we should clap. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like when someone starts clapping, you know, yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah, clap. And let me be clear. That is not for the musicians. It's for God. We are clapping to God at the end of the song. Why? Because I believe what we just sang. I believe it's true. I'm going to clap. So none none of these half week claps. Let's give it our all. We are praising God. It is not about them. They're helping us give something fitting to God. And God is beautiful. So we want to give something beautiful. And praise is beautiful. Praise is beautiful. All right, let's turn to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five, that's where we're gonna be for the rest of today. Why do we sing praise is beautiful, our God is beautiful, and the psalmist tells us that a song of praise is fitting. Why are we looking at Ephesians if we're talking about a Hebrew word? Uh, Ephesians is a New Testament, New Testament wasn't written in Hebrew. Well, uh, what's helpful to understand scripture is that the Old Testament, though written in Hebrew, was translated into Greek, which is what the New Testament is predominantly written in, in that time. Um, And it's helpful to look at those things because those were people in that time that helped take a Hebrew word that is, right, we said is really complex and put it into that language. So it's connecting things that uh, a New Testament word, though it's in a completely different language, would have been an equivalent to uh, something in the Old Testament. And this passage of scripture is an embodiment of Zamar to sing praises to God. And there's a couple of those, but this is where we're going to be today. Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 through 20. And God, I just pray as we read this, that we would take it as it is, that it is the word of God, um, the very breath of God, profitable for teaching and training and righteousness. And um, so Holy Spirit, would you just help us understand? Would you help us um, not just let it go in one ear out the other, but would we take it for what it is, uh, that it is the very, you use ordinary men to write your words. And so these are your words. And so uh, we wanna learn from, learn from them in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, Ephesians chapter five, starting in verse 15. And before I get into it, Paul really uses some comparison here that we're gonna look at before we get into the um, the kind of the meat of what we're gonna look at today. But verse 15 says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. Let's pause there. Again, Paul's making some comparisons here. Let's look at the first one. Wise, unwise. Okay, wise, unwise. There's a difference there. Helpful. Foolish, 
understanding what the will of the Lord is, right? Being drunk with wine and being filled with the spirit. You may think, well, th those aren't really opposites. Well, drunk with wine was just the, uh, the most dominant example for foolishness. So the opposite of foolishness would be to be filled with the spirit. Uh, you know, Eugene Peterson in, the, in the, I think the message translation, he, he writes, you know, don't drink wine, it cheapens your life, drink of the spirit. Um, and so he's trying, Paul's trying to communicate these, these, these comparisons uh, and then begins to go tell us what that looks like. So what is wise? What is making the best use of your time? What is understanding what the will of the Lord is and how are we to be filled with the spirit? And that's where we pick up in verse 19. It's the same sentence, it flows right into it. But be filled with the spirit, comma, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do we see there in those first couple of comparisons? One, worship is wise. Worship is wise. Singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs is making the best use of your time. Right? He's, he's, trying, he's trying to make this comparison. He's literally saying, make the best use of your time for the days are evil, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. So can I challenge you? Coming here on a sunny morning to sing to God is making the best use of your time. Let that challenge you. Let, challenge, let that challenge your calendar. Let that challenge your heart. He is saying it is wise. It's the best use of your time to come with one another. We'll talk about that in a second. Giving to God melody in our heart, singing to him with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, giving thanks to him. That is making the best use of your time. It's wise. It's, 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 understand, it's literally the will of God for your life. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Worship is wise, singing is making the best use of your time and is literally the will of God. Let that be our, pre let, let that be the base from where we work from this morning. As we talk about singing praises to God, it's wise, it's making the best, I love that, making the best use of your time. Meaning it is not just physical, there is a spiritual reality at play when we come together as the church to sing and to worship God which is the number one reason for the church, to worship God. So I want to take the rest of this passage of scripture and bring to us some things about singing praise. Um, I don't know how many there are, there are quite a few, but we're gonna kind of just go through them. The first one being singing helps us praise God. Singing helps us praise God. Not all praise is singing, but the activity of singing, using our voices as instruments to praise God, helps us praise God. Because when we sing, we draw our attention to God. And that's how we give him praise. So when we come together to sing, this activity, it draws our attention to God, which helps us draw near to God. And we give him praise. Have you ever been in this kind of setting though? And you just get kind of caught up in the singing and you get caught up in the music. And then it's kind of like when you're, when you're driving home from work and you get all the way to your driveway and you're like, how did I get here? Isn't that just the most like bewildering feeling in the world? You're like, I was going 70 miles per hour and I don't even remember it. Like I was with other cars that could have been date, right? But it just becomes so much of second nature. We kind of just get lost, we get blind. And then we're like, how did we get home? The same is true, I think, for worship sometimes. We sing and we sing and we sing and we're praising God. And then we're like, what did I just even say? Like, I don't even remember what I just said. I don't remember what I did. And I wanna, I wanna bring to you to a passage that helps us. I, I really wanna challenge us here because I think it's so easy. I, you know, I've been to more, you know, more church services than I can count. And it's so easy to just get caught up in the music. And I'm not even, like, I'm not even thinking about lunch necessarily. I, I'm, I'm just not really thinking. I'm just kind of caught up in the midst of it. It's just, it's just kind of blind and I'm just singing these songs and I'm like, I don't remember singing. I don't remember what I was doing. Did I kneel down? Did I lift my hands? I don't know, right? And this passage is so interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're not gonna turn there, but Paul is, is talking about speaking in tongues specifically. And he talks about how, 
that when you speak in tongues in the local, he's talking about the gathering. When you speak in tongues in the gathering out loud and there's no interpreter, it's not beneficial because when I speak in tongues to a gathering, I don't know what I'm saying and you don't know what I'm saying. So what good is that? Does that make sense? He's like, this is, no, this is no benefit. So he's like, I'd rather speak five words in a language you understand that encourages you and builds you up than a thousand in a tongue that doesn't edify any of us. That's what he says. And so then he goes on in verse 15, and he literally goes like, well, well then what am I to do? What, what am I to do with that? He, and then he says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. And then he says, I will sing with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. What am I trying to communicate to you? I'm trying to communicate that it is clearly good to be aware of what we are doing and saying in worship. When we come to the church to sing praises to God, it is good for you to be aware, praying and singing with your minds fully engaged. So that when I sing, I'm not just singing blindly, like I don't know what I'm doing after the fact, but I'm singing with my mind engaged, fixated on God, actually thinking and engaging with what I am singing and what I am doing. That is important. That is so important. And we need to not just come and get lost in the music and lost in the singing, though we'll talk about feelings and emotions and how that plays a part, but we need to have our minds fully in engaged. In tandem with that, you know, singing helps us praise God. Singing helps us pray to God. Whether you know it or not, when we are singing, we are praying. When we are singing, we are, you know, whether you're singing individually or corporately, which is what I'm focusing on today, is, is we are asking of God things. We're asking God things. We are asking him for things. We are asking him to come and move. We are asking him to bring revival. We're asking him, that is prayer. It is sung prayer. It helps us pray to God. Again, with our minds fully engaged, we can actually pray. We can actually pray on God. It's pretty hard to pray without our mind engaged. And so that's good. It's singing helps us pray to God. The next one, singing helps us remember God's word. In a parallel verse, uh, Colossians chapter three, verses 16 and 17, it's so parallel, it could be almost the same passage of scripture. It talks about giving thanks. It talks about Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, both written by Paul. So obviously he's trying to communicate a similar idea to the church in Ephesus that he's trying to communicate to the church in Colossae, right? So the, the, that, that's, that's easy um, uh, connection there. But what something is added in Colossians chapter three, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Meaning psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs help the word of God marinate and go deep into your heart. Dwell in you richly to remember God's word. Because here is the reality. While a small tear comes down my cheek, you're not gonna remember this message most likely. I know, sad, sad for me. No, but you will remember this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the... You're never going to forget that, <laughs> ever. That is locked in your brain for all of eternity. Singing helps you remember the word of God. What do we, the first lyric we sang this morning, your word is like a lamp to my feet. That's the word of God. When you sing, it helps you remember the word of God. Let it dwell in you richly, which is the goal. We do not read scripture to check off boxes. We do not read scripture to just make it through. We read it so that it goes in and digests and becomes super richly dwelling within us, right? That is what Paul is trying to communicate here. Singing helps us remember God's word. Next one, singing helps connect our emotions and heart to God's word. Singing helps connect our emotions and heart to God's word. Singing connects emotion with truth, the desperation of coming to him in song and praise with the doctrine of the lyrics, the scriptures that we are singing. 
Singing helps connect those things. And I think in a setting like this, again, kind of the pendulum swing, you could maybe land on one or two sides, one of two sides. In, in you know, a Pentecostal charismatic setting like this one, I think it can be good for us to be cautious of emotionalism. That we're just coming in, we're singing, just looking and seeking after a pleasant experience that feels good. That is not the goal. That does not worship God. If that is all we are after, that is not, it's supposed to be unto God. Does that mean that worship is void of emotions? Absolutely not. I think the call of scripture is to worship God with your whole being, heart, soul, mind, emotions, and your emotions are a big part of that. Specifically here, I think, you know, this idea uh, that I, I want to remind us of that I don't think it's inauthentic to sing something you don't mean, but want to. It is not inauthentic to sing something you don't mean, but you want to mean. I need to sometimes tell my soul what I don't feel, but I want to mean. I don't know if I believe that, but I want to. And so I'm gonna sing. It is not, in it might feel a little incongruent at times, feeling like I'm singing, but can I tell you, what's not gonna help is saying, well, I'm just not gonna participate because I don't mean that. I don't mean those words. I think that oftentimes is how people end up leaving the church. Stop following Jesus because they think, well, I can't sing the songs and I can't do the things because it feels inauthentic. And I think sometimes we have to tell our soul what is true, what we know to believe, even when we don't feel it. And that is not inauthentic. It is having faith and saying, I know this is true. And even if I don't mean it right now, I want to mean it. So I'm going to sing it and I'm going to praise God. That's not inauthentic. All that to say that worship includes our emotions. It just has to go beyond emotions to a life of worship, a life of worship. Singing is an expression of the spirit. Singing is an expression of the spirit. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Paul is making it clear that this is not just physical, it is spiritual, it is an expression of the spirit to sing and to worship God in this way. And what I love about this is that Paul is not writing to just the worship leaders in Ephesus. He is writing to the whole church. Meaning, that includes you. Singing is an expression of the spirit that we all are called into, that we are all supposed to participate in. I think it's, um, oh gosh, what's his name? He writes a system, Wayne Grudem, writes a systematic theology book. It's about as big as my body. Um, <laughs> I'd love to read it all at one point, but, um, but he talks about how when we come into a setting like this sanctuary and we worship God, that the throne of God, the place in which we are directing our focus is actually there. We just can't see it. And I love that because it helps remind me that when I come into this place, I am not just singing and it's just like a, a good noise that comes from this room and it's just purely physical. No, I am actually directing at my focus at the unseen, but more real realm than the chair that I'm sitting on. And I'm worshiping the God who is there and Jesus who is at his right hand. 
I am coming and I'm drawing near to the throne of God with confidence. Knowing that when I do that and I acknowledge, he didn't, he wasn't not here before you got here and then we started singing and he came into the room. No, he is here and when we sing, what we're doing is we're practicing his presence. We're acknowledging that God, you are here and I am beholding you and I'm worshiping you. I cannot see it with my eyes, but it is real, more real than I could ever fathom. Singing is an expression of the spirit. Singing, worship to God is spiritual. And it's one that the whole community is called into. Singing is also an expression of thanksgiving. Singing is an expression of thanksgiving, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Singing helps us give thanks to God. Singing praises helps us give thanks to God. Singing when directed at God is not an expression of talent or ability. I'm not expressing this thing that I'm really good at. That's not, that's not what this is. It's not an expression of talent or ability. It's one of thanksgiving. Meaning, when we talk about singing praises to God, and the fact that it's something our whole community is supposed to come into and do. Scripture commands us to do. The question is not, do I have a voice? It's not it. It's not what it's about at all. The question should be, am I thankful? The question is not, do you have a voice? It's, are, are you thankful? and sing praises to God. He is worthy of it. Praise is beautiful, our God is beautiful. It is fitting to sing praises. It is good to sing praises to our God. Can I encourage somebody who feels like you're, you don't like to sing because your voice isn't good? That is not what God is judging. God is judging that you are singing from a thankful heart because it is an expression of the spirit of God being filled with the spirit. And it is an expression of thanksgiving in my heart for what God has done. Are you thankful? Then sing praises to your God. Stop making it about your voice and start making it about your praise. Are you thankful? Then sing to God. We'll come back to Thanksgiving as we end, but one more thing. Singing promotes community in the body of Christ. I love this, although I will confess that I've missed this as I've read this passage of scripture. Verse 19, or let's start verse 18. It says, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. Oh, there goes the AC. <laughs> but be filled with the spirit. Verse 19, addressing one another. Say one another. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So what Paul is communicating here is though our singing and our praise is to, is to be directed at the Lord, it is also addressed to one another. Meaning part of your singing is that you are exhorting, instructing, and teaching the people on your right and your left. So isn't it just, I, I don't know about you, but there's an intangible feeling that I love when I'm standing next to people and I, I can hear their voice and we are singing the same thing of praise to God. That's an intangible feeling I, I can't articulate. But what Paul is telling us here is that you are exhorting one another. You know, sometimes I, I sing things that I don't mean, but I want to. And so when, I, when I'm next to somebody though, and they're singing, they're instructing me, they're exhorting me. 
They're urging me to praise God. It is a communal thing that we do, we come together. Your praise, though it is directed at God, is addressed to one another. You are instructing and teaching and exhorting, exhorting meaning you're urging them to praise. You are exhorting the people on your left and your right. We're not just singing to God as individuals. We are coming together corporately together to worship God. And there is something unique about that. There is something special about that. I'm gonna make a bold statement. God does his best work and his most unique work when the body of Christ is together. I, I think that's true. Does God move individually? Yes, but where two or three are more gathered. <laughs> I think there's something special and unique to coming here. That's why it's so beautiful. I, I, I'm thankful for people who can't make it and get to watch online or when you're on vacation or when you're sick, but there is something that you cannot get anywhere else but coming to the body, gathering as the body, not neglecting that. And there's something unique and special that God does. He does his best work. He manifests in unique ways that he does not do anywhere else than he does right here. When we sing, it promotes community and unity in the body of Christ. When you sing, you are singing to God, but you are, you, it is, is affecting the people on your right and your left. You are exhorting them, instructing them, teaching them. And I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> Finally, this is kind of a, a repeat of um, the last one, but um, music sung and played with thanksgiving in our hearts glorifies God. That's it, plain and simple. Music sung and played with thanksgiving in our hearts glorifies God. Thanksgiving is the secret ingredient that both causes our praise, right? Are you thankful? Then sing to God but it is also what makes our praise right and good and acceptable. It, it, it spells it out in Hebrews chapter 12. Come before God with thanksgiving in your hearts, reverence and awe to give him acceptable worship. Thanksgiving is that ingredient. It is the cause, the reason for our worship. We are thankful, so we sing praises, but it is what makes my praise acceptable and pleasing to God. Thanksgiving in my heart. Because here is the reality. We are not singing because we have to out of obligation. We are singing out of response to the goodness of God. We are singing out of the response to the goodness of God. Let me close with these two verses. James chapter five, verse 13 says this, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Psalm 47, verse one, again, says this, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, for he is beautiful, and a song of praise is fitting. Are you thankful? Are you thankful for what God has done in your life? Are you thankful for what God did in his son Jesus? Are you thankful? Then let the church sing. Let the church sing.